brown pie in, okay, indicates the soil. Uh, soil is 25% water and 25% air. So half of a good soil is not soil at all. It's water and air. And you need 5% organic matter, fertilizer, and the rest, 45% is mineral salts, clay, silt, and sand. So that's good soil. So you can make your soil yourself. And this is a recipe for making soil. Don't Please don't write this down, it's not necessary. The point is that, that uh, mixing in the peat moss, the vermiculite, the compost, you might have compost in your own yard, but you're going to, have to go out and buy the peat moss and buy the vermiculite and buy the fine sand and buy the fertilizer and buy the lime. So if you're like most backyard gardeners, uh, making your own soil doesn't save you a lot of money. What you want to do is buy some potting mix. And there's several good brands of potting mix out there, all of which are ideal for pollinator gardens and pots, and all of which have fertilizer in them as well. So buy some uh, pre-made potting mix. Okay, what about overwintering the plants? We'll talk about which plants in a little bit, but once you have your plants in, and now it's the end of the season, what do you do with them? How do you keep them safe over the winter so they don't freeze? Now in Baltimore, uh, the average low for January is 29 degrees. So that's not too bad, but you, you get freezing at that, obviously. And the lowest temperature in recent years, it was back in 2016, went down to eight degrees. So we're in zone 7B. So zone 7B, the plants that you find in zone 7B should be okay if you get even down as low as uh, five degrees, zero to five degrees Fahrenheit, as long as you protect them. So how do we protect the plants? So you have to overwinter the pots. And the chief reason to do this is to prevent a freeze thaw cycle, because if the plants, if the, if the water freezes, it expands. And if it expands, it pushes up the plants out of the soil, number one. And number two, it gets into the cells of the plant itself and will destroy the cells by, by stretching them. When plants are out of the soil and they're very deep, you don't have to worry about this, but in a shallow pot you do. So you need to prevent the freeze thaw cycle. And if you're gonna keep your pots outside, don't keep them on concrete uh, or metal, keep them on soil because the soil acts as a natural source of heat. And keep the pots somewhere where they're out of the wind. So you want to prevent a freeze thaw cycle, keep the pots on the soil, keep them out of the wind. And you don't have to water very much during the winter and you definitely do not want to water when the soil is frozen, okay? I mean, think of what happens in nature. What happens in nature, you get snow on the ground when it's frozen and that snow gradually seeps into the ground as things warm up. And you don't want to put a whole lot of water on those pots when everything is frozen. Okay, so what are the methods of, of keeping everything safe? So here's an easy method. You, you put it, all your pots in some wind protected area and you'll just line them up like this. Or you can bury the pots. This is really the best method. The problem with this, of course, is if you have enough space to bury all your pots, you probably don't need to have a container garden. You could probably put a pollinator garden in there. But that is another way, bury the pots. Or you can use bubble wrap. Bubble wrap works great around the pot. It's not expensive and it keeps everything nice and warm. Even burlap is enough to keep things fairly warm and prevent the freeze thaw cycles. So you can use any of these methods to overwinter pots that have perennials in them. Uh, this is just heavy plastic and it certainly keeps the wind out uh, and that is helpful as well. So there are a number of methods you can try and you do what works best for you. But the idea basically is to, is to give them a little bit less of mother nature than they would normally get in a cold day. Uh, here are, are pots that are in a cold frame, which is a very nice idea, except you probably, if you have a cold frame, you wanna use it for other things that you wanna grow during the winter. Or you can put them in the shed. This certainly protects them from the wind and it will keep them a little bit warm as well. 
So those are all different methods for taking care of your plants over the winter. All right, now, what about if you have plants that are going and they've gone through the winter all right, you know, how do you keep your pots going from one year to the next with the perennials? And one thing you need to do is you have to add fertilizer in the form of either compost or a fresh potting soil each year. And then every few years, you actually have to transfer your plants into all new potting soil. So you can't use just the same old potting soil every year. Every year, add compost or fresh potting soil. Every few years, transfer the plants to brand new potting soil. All right, now we're going to talk about the plants themselves. So if you're starting to take notes, don't take any notes, please. Uh, I gave Morgan several handouts that have all the specific information on it, but I just want to show you some pictures to give you an idea of how to go about doing this. So this is planting in containers, the thrill, spill, and fill method, or the single cultivar method. Either you can have multiple plants in one container, or you can have one plant in a container and use multiple containers. So here's an example of the uh, thrill spill fill method. So here are some very tall penstemone plants, foxgloves, some shorter foxgloves, and some pansies, which when they get larger will flip over the side. So that's thrill, spill, and fill. Here's another one. This is, uses grass as the, as the thrill, and it uses this uh, greenery as the spill and some brightly colored uh, galardia for the, um, for the fill. All right. Now, if you do it though, if you want to use single cultivars, you can use one plant in each pot. So the advantage of this is that if you're trying to get plants in bloom for an entire season, you can take the plants that are out of bloom and put them in the back and the plants that are just coming into bloom and put them in the front. Or if you have some plants that require more sun, you can move them around during the day a little bit. So, so this method that uses multiple pots, it's not as beautiful to the eye as to see one of these thrill spill fill type pots, uh, but it certainly is very useful in keeping plants going all year long. Here's another example of the same idea, okay? All right, or you can make a raised bed that's nice and high and you can actually design your own garden and keep it there. And this is something you have to cover with bubble wrap or something during the winter because the perennials and something that's shallow will not survive. All right, so, as we said before, what the pollinators want are 75% natives, drifts if it's possible, but usually with containers it's not, and a variety of plants in constant bloom. Now, what the pollinators do not want are plants that they can't get to the pistil to get in the anthers to get the pollen. So these are all closed plants. Here's a closed dahlia. This is a closed impatience, and this is a rose. So this is no good for pollinators. Now, towards the end of the season, there are several dahlias that open up a bit. So at the end of the season, the dahlias are, are good. But for most of the season, the bees and the butterflies cannot get to them. Now, on the other hand, here's a, here are the same three plants, dahlia, impatience, roses, but all of these have open petals. So the pollinators can get to the anthers to get the pollen and get to the pistil to deliver the pollen. So you wanna use plants that are open plants. All right, now, which plants do you use? There is a, a huge abundance of plants and some of the handouts I gave to Morgan, which she told me she's already delivered to everybody, will indicate which plants to use. Uh, and we will go through these, uh, these some pictures of these just to give you the idea. All right, there's the perennials, which are natives and non-native both, annuals, spring bulbs, and herbs. And in your garden, although we try to have 75% perennials, 
you may find you have more success if you have more annuals, more spring herbs and more herbs because you do, these only require annual treatment and every year you start all over again. One of the handouts you have is a thriller spiller filler handout. And on that handout, it shows all the plants from the ones that bloom early to the ones that bloom late, how long they bloom, how much sun they need, and what are their height is, tall, uh, spillers, or, or low height. And also, it is it indicated on the handout that you were given which plants are good host plants for various butterflies. So this is a very useful thing to use. All right, let's go through the native perennials first. In the early season, you have wild indigo. Here's a bumblebee at the wild after wild indigo. They love it. You have spiderwort, which drips over the side. There's a great spill. Butterflies love this. You have honeysuckle, which is also very tall. If you want to, if you want to use a spiller and a filler technique. And there's a, another bee after, another honeybee after the, this flower. Or you can use phlox. This is an interesting way to use a container on its side. But phlox is a nice early bloomer as well. This is called agapostamin, which is a beautiful native bee we have in Baltimore. Wild geranium looks beautiful in a pot, also early. Here's a mason bee. Blue-eyed grass, which is a, a short uh, grass, comes up and is good as a, uh, as a filler. Notice on this honeybee, all of this yellow stuff here, this is all pollen this honeybee is carrying. These bees carry, can carry half their weight in pollen. Virginia bluebells. This one is called a sulfur butterfly. The butterflies like Virginia bluebells. So that was early season. What about mid season? Mid season, you have yarrow. And the foxglow I showed a picture of earlier is a very good mid season plant. Monarda is a terrific mid season plant, as is Rudbeckia, black eyed Susan, which the butterflies like is a checker spot on, on, on Rudbeckia. And phlox. This is a hawk moth. I haven't seen one of these in my yard for years, but they're an interesting little fellow. Okay, evening primrose. These are sweat bees after the evening primrose. Coneflowers, echinacea, helianthus, sunflowers. Uh, Huchera is a beautiful perennial that comes back in his mid season, and Coriopsis as well, mid season. What about mid to late season? Okay, there's Agastache. Hummingbirds love Agastache. There's Liatris. There's the great blue lobelia. And this is mountain mint. Mountain mint is the, has the highest nectar of any plant there is. And bees absolutely love this because of its high nectar content. It's also not a very showy flower, but it makes a great uh, flower to use uh, along with other flowers if you're gonna cut flowers and bring them into the house. All right, what's this one? This one is a kind of milkweed. This is uh, Asclepius tuberosa. And this is the monarch butterfly caterpillar, which likes all kinds of Asclepia. Okay. And then late season, we have several plants as well. New England aster, goldenrod, solidago, thoroughwort, Joe pieweed, all of these will grow in, uh, in pots. Uh, this, is a, this is a sedum, and this is a chair underneath it. This is called Autumn Bride, this particular kind of uh, huchera. Okay, so those are the perennials that are native. You'd like to use as many of those as you can, because again, the pollinators are often picky, and the, the natives they definitely will go to, the non-native perennials, it's, you'll have to see what happens in your own backyard. 
but there are some beautiful ones that you can buy. Globe thistle, Gallardia. Here's one you don't want, butterfly bush. It sounds like you should want this. And in fact, it doesn't track butterflies, but the problem with butterfly bush is it's an invasive and it tends to take over other parts of your garden. So you avoid butterfly bush. But daisies are beautiful to have. Lavender, guara, Russian sage, all of these are on the list that I gave you. Here's another picture of sedum and some periwinkle, which also trails very nicely over, the, over a pot. Okay, what about the annuals? Annuals, you don't have to worry about uh, overwintering. You have cardinal vine and cosmos. These are very good tall flowers if you want to use multiple flowers and you want to use these as the thrillers. Salvia, firecracker vine, nicotinia. This is a beautiful passion flower. And I'm showing all of these in pots because they grow in pots uh, as well as in the ground. Sometimes not as often not as tall, but they will grow. Lantana and verbena, all annuals. And most of these that I'm showing you are still have plenty of nectar. So the bees and the butterflies all like them very much. Marigolds, heliotrope, zinnias, which I have loads of in my yard because there's so many different kinds and the deer do not like them. And the uh, bees, I have at least five different varieties of bees that go after the zinnias as well as all the butterflies. And this is Pentis. Alyssum, annual flocks, Lobelia, Bacopa, Nasturtium. All of these are annuals that grow in pots. So you have lots of choices. What about bulbs? There are lots of bulbs. I'm gonna, I'll just show them all briefly. In the, in the early part of the uh, season, you have glory of the snow and snowdrops, followed by aconites and allium and crocuses. All of these are fairly early. Hyacinths and water lily tulips. Not all tulips are good for, for uh, pollinator gardens, but these are and others as well, muscari, Siberian squill, bluebells, wood anemones. Okay, here's an example of planting bulbs at different levels. So the, the ones that are planted at the bottom take longer to emerge than the ones that are planted at the top. So this way you extend your season for the bulbs because it takes longer for these to end up blooming. Here's another picture of the allium. Okay, also herbs are very good uh, in a pollinator garden and in the pollinator pots. So here's dill and you have a butterfly going after that. And fennel. And parsley. Here is an example of an herb garden in a pot. It's nothing but herbs. Here's another one in a pot. It's a beautiful garden. If you have a garden like this though, and you keep picking the herbs to use in your kitchen, the bees and the butterflies aren't gonna to get to them. You have, to let these, uh, you have to let these herbs bolt. When they bolt, that's when they have the flower on them. And that's when the bees and the we like them. So if you plant something like this, think of half of it as being for your, your kitchen and the other half just let bolt for the bees and the butterflies. This is just marks what they are, the chives, the dill, the tarragon, and the uh, curly parsley, as well as the flat parsley on here. Here's some mint. All right, so the thyme, the, and so forth. Okay, borage is a very good bud to grow. It's very beautiful. Uh, you don't use it much in the kitchen, so the bees will get all, they want, all they want of it. Lemongrass, pineapple mint, lavender, and rue. Here's another close up of thyme. 
and cat mint, all of these I'm, I'm showing in pots to show that they in fact will grow in pots. Oregano, uh, blue basil, and chives. So all of these are perfectly okay to use in a container garden. All right, so in summary, you know, why are we putting a, 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 this garden in? Why a pollinator garden we want because the, we want to give the pollinators something to eat and we want to make sure that the flowers in our yard, wherever they are, end up having something to transfer the pollen to them. And why doing it in containers? Well, for the reasons we talked about, either you don't have enough space, the soil isn't any good, or you have no sun. Uh, but they also make a beautiful addition to any patio. Um, the soil has to be the right kind of soil, use potting soil. And you always think of what the pollinators need, and that, that means the nectar. If you buy annual plants, uh, lots of these hybrids don't have nectar in them. And you'll have to see what happens in your yard, which plants the bees go after. And I show you a bunch that they would go after. And then we talked a little bit about what, what to do with the flowers and all the ways you can design things in a pot. Then the question is what to do about the winter and beyond. You have to protect them in the winter against wind. Uh, you can bury them, you can put them in a garage, you can cover them with a, with a wrap, either burlap uh, or a plastic wrap, but you have to take care of them in the winter if you have perennials there, because the roots don't have any place to go and they can't get away from the freezing temperatures. And then going on beyond that, every year you have to make sure and re rejuvenate your soil with some compost or more potting soil and every few years replace all the potting soil. So having a garden in containers for pollinators is a lot of work, uh, but it does give you a beautiful garden. And that's the end of the talk and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Morgan, back to you. Thank you so much, Michael. So there's a number of questions um, in the chat. So I can just kind of start like reading those. Um, and yeah, and thank you again for the beautiful presentation. It's awesome. Um, so Anna wants to know, um, she says, my planters are on concrete. Should I raise them off the concrete for the winter? I could use bricks or riser. No, no you, you should not get them off the concrete and try to put them onto soil or wood uh, because the concrete, um, the, the, if you can find a place that, that has soil, good old dirt, that will prevent the, that will be the best insulation. The second best thing is to put them inside in a, in a garage but don't put them outdoors on bricks or raised up or on concrete because uh, you're asking for trouble. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, and I guess, I don't know if this is a question or a comment, but Tammy was saying, um, look at your dill and fennel carefully before cutting it for food. There may be caterpillars or eggs on them. Be careful to let them grow and feed on your herbs. That's a great comment. Yeah, there's right. so, yeah, yeah. so many. You gotta, the, the herbs look so good for eating. You gotta remember who they're there for in part. So what I do in my garden is um, I, I do use my herbs, but I plant plenty of them. So there's some for me and there's some for the bees and some for the butterflies. That's awesome. Sharing in the abundance. Um, so Anthony, asked, are you better off starting your plants from seed or buying them as plants from reliable places? All right, uh, plant, you're, you're, you're better off, it's certainly faster if you buy them from, from plants. You certainly can do it from seeds, but with perennials, native perennials from seed, it may take you a few years in order for you to get a plant that blooms. So here you are, you have your container, you put seeds in, you get a little bit of something, but not much to, for a show the first year. And then you have to do all the overwintering things and go through the same thing for another season. So if you want more bang for your buck, buy them as plants. The exception is things like some annuals, for example, like zinnias. You can put those in the, any annual you can put in the seeds. 
and you'll get blooms the first year. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. I'm also putting, I know I said I would put the, um, the YouTube channel that we have in the chat. So we, yeah, we just had a workshop about starting native perennial seeds. So if you are interested in that, you can go to the channel and look at that video. Um, and then Linda asked roughly what time period do the plants need protection first to last frost or other? Exactly, first to last frost. But the, the, the old question is, well, when are we gonna get our first frost? So you, you wanna, Usually by, traditionally we, not this year, but traditionally we get our first frost by October 15th. So you want to have a, a plan in place before then. And if you see that the next day, you're going to have a problem with frost. That's when uh, you don't go to the movies and instead you bundle up your plants and put them away. Oh, that's good advice. Um, Anthony asked, if you're reusing your planters after a few years, should you be cleaning them? And if so, how? Should you be cleaning your planters? Uh, it, it, it all depends. Usually, you don't have to clean the planters unless you've had some disease problem on your plants. If you have, then you should definitely clean the planters. You know, how, can, how do you clean the planters? You, you can scrub them with uh, just hot water in a scrub brush, and that's usually enough. Um, if you leave those planters and you don't use them for the next season, for that winter, they'll be fine the next year. Um, but so if, if there's no disease, don't clean them. If there is disease, yes, clean them. Cool. Thank you. Um, that was the last question in the chat, but if anybody else has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask them now. Can also be- Okay, well, story. anyway, look, happy gardening, everybody. But I, I just wanted to say again, what Morgan said at the beginning, which is our committee um, loves to help uh, community gardens get started, whether it's a church group or a school group or a community that has some common space they want to work with together. Uh, we have a whole system for helping you get started with a pollinator garden. So if you, if you need some advice, just call, just ask Morgan and she'll tell you how to get in touch with me. Um, if it's okay with you, do you want me to put your email in the chat? Michael? Yes. There you go. I don't see my I don't see the chat on here right now, though. I don't know how to get to it. Oh. Um, oh, also, I, got, I, got, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna put it in the chat to everyone. All right. Cool. Um and then yeah, so Michael, I know you mentioned that there were a couple more handouts. I know I sent everybody the thrill and spill thrillers and spillers. Uh, that's the only one I think I got from you, but if you send me the rest, I'll, I'll email them out in the follow-up email. I, I sent you about five handouts about a, a couple of months ago and you thanked me for them. I'll send, oh. them I'll, I'll send them out to you again. Okay, that's weird. Cause yeah, when I went through my email, I like, I don't know, maybe my email deleted it or something All automatically. Right. I'm sorry about that. But yeah, well, I sent everybody a thriller and spillers you. and I'll, I'll follow up with the rest of those. Um, after this event, um, cool. Well, are there any more questions, comments, concerns? Anybody? Oh, one more question. Um, do you know of certain plants that attract unique pollinators other than honeybees? Do I know certain plants that attract pollinators other than honey honeybees? The, the answer is all the, all the plants I sh showed you will attract uh, at least uh, 20 varieties of native bees. Now, honeybees are generalists, so they will go to any plant. So I can't give you a name of a plant that the honeybees will not go to. Uh, they will go to every plant. Um, but the native bees are, are more particular, but if you use this variety of plants, 
you'll get a lot of native bees there as well. Um, and then what variety of milkweed is native to Maryland? Well, the uh, it's native to our, our zone um, is Asclepius tuberosa, is Asclepius um, incarnata, and Asclepius syriaca. Um, so all of those, all of those are native to our, our general area. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, okay, well, if there is, if anyone has any more questions, it's your last chance. Okay. I guess not. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming tonight. And thank you, Michael, for this thank amazing you. presentation. Um, so next week, or actually two weeks from now, on the 18th, uh, we'll be having another lecture. Um, it'll be about urban beekeeping. Um, and our presenter is actually in the audience today. Uh, cool, truly. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'll follow up uh, with additional handouts as well as a link to the recording. And yeah, everybody have an awesome night. Thank you. Bye-bye.